Mr. John Corcoran. How are you? I'm great, Dominic. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'm excited to have you here. I was a guest on your show. Now you're a guest on my show. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hopefully we have a chance to talk about your show today. Yeah. Yeah. We'll work it in there. Yeah. Let's do it. Um, So, you know, you're speaking to a group of contractors, construction professionals here, Mm -hmm. you know, forward facing, looking at making a making changes in the way they run their business and doing things a little bit differently, getting new perspectives. And boy, do you have a different perspective. <laughs> you've seen, you've seen stuff. Yeah, I've seen stuff. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah. John, let me do this. John Corcoran, who the heck are you? And how okay. is it that you come to be speaking to this group of construction business owners all around the world? Yeah, so I have a strange story. Um, I've I've worked in some a, a variety of different industries. So I worked in the air, entertainment industry in Hollywood. Uh, you know, lit, worked for DreamWorks. So I can say I worked for Steven Spielberg wow. indirectly, not directly, indirectly. Yeah. Um, then I I also worked in Washington D.C. I worked in the White House uh, many that years ago. That blows me away. Just uh, yeah. crazy. Yeah, I interned first in the speech writing office and then got a job as a writer, presidential letters and messages. I kind of say it's kind of like a second tier speech writer. We wrote all the stuff that they didn't want to write. And then I was a speech writer for a governor of California. And and um, and now I've run a, a company called Rise 25 and run my own podcast for the last 12 years. And, um, you know, even had uh, a Berkshire Hathaway company as a client. So you could say that I indirectly worked for uh, um, for uh, Warren Buffett. So Steven yeah. Spielberg, Warren Buffett, uh, presidents, uh, governors. I've, I've, I've worked for a variety of different people. Now, how does that relate to to contractors? That's a that's probably the most relevant question. Yeah, they're um, asking. What, they're the, they're captured first, but they're going to ask that next. Yeah, absolutely. It's a relevant question. Um, the 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 through line is it's all about relationships. You know, every career, every business is about relationships, and that's really what's been core to what I've done. And when I was a kid, my father got laid off three separate times. We always had to move far away, usually across the country, 3000 miles away to get a new job. Right. And I realized it was about relationships because in his industry, he didn't have the right relationships. I studied that when I was in high school and I applied mm-hmm. it to my life. And that's where all the opportunities have come from. Not because I, my parents weren't well connected or anything like that in those industries, but it became, it came from figuring out how to navigate relationships with the right people. And so that's what, what I, I love talking about. Yeah. Do you, I mean, you've been rubbing elbows with some, you know, the highest levels of politics and business uh, in, in just those short stories you said there, and I'm sure many other people and your, your podcast is about business as well. So you interview lots of top business and thought leaders there, but when, when it comes to relationships, can you really make your own connections or do you have to get introduced to the right people? Or can you just start from scratch and start meeting the right people? Absolutely. You can do it yourself. And that's the way I've approached it the entire time. Mm-hmm. I mean, relation, you can, relationships can come from your network. You know, you can certainly get introductions. You should get introductions from people you know already, but there's nothing stopping you. I mean, especially today in today's day and age, it's so much easier to reach out across this digital world that we you know live yeah. in and connect with virtually anyone and borders are meaningless these days you know when it comes to doing things digitally you can reach all the way across the globe so yeah i'm a huge fan of doing that and there's no reason why you should stop yourself from doing it nope we have the freedoms in our country that says you're allowed to call anybody you want you're allowed to email anybody you want there's no limitations right do you, right. Do you know the first place i i learned that you just reminded me of it is uh Gentleman I know through EO, which is a group you and I are both in, Brian Scudamore, who started 1-800-GOT-JUNK, he once told me that it was amazing how many business authors he would reach out to who said, you're the first guy that ever contacted me. <laughs> and these are book authors that are you know, best-selling authors who said, wow, somebody took the time to find me and reach out. And these are years ago before yeah. what you just said here, it's just the digital world. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Crazy. And yeah, and it's, and it's easier now because there's... It's so easy to combine that with content marketing. So you could record a video over Zoom and upload it to YouTube, you know, so that it becomes less of an inconvenience. You're not like asking them for their time or you're not asking for a free informational interview or anything like that. You're actually helping to promote them. It doesn't take that much effort on your part, but you're actually helping with that. But I love that Brian was doing that, you know, years ago. Years ago. Years ago. But, you know, the thing is, like, there are people of incredible, tremendous stature that are still doing it to these days. You know, I mean, Reed Hoffman is the 
the founder of LinkedIn. And I see him doing this. He's going out and he's interviewing other billionaires, billionaires interviewing billionaires. Imagine that, right? Yeah. Crazy. Really cool to see though. Yeah. But if I, they can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. And there's nothing stopping us. And by the way, when it comes to relationships, we're not just talking about, I know that you have experience. You've been in the room with presidents, with governors, and you've written the speeches and you probably got you know the giggles when they actually read your lines. But for the contractors who are listening to the show, we're not talking about getting to do contracting for the White House. It could be the Hernandez family in the most awesome cul-de-sac in the city that you're trying to get to. Right. Relationships exactly. are going to get you, you know, Hernandez, Chan, Smith, Jones, doesn't matter what it is, yeah. right? But we're just yeah. trying to get there. So we can, I want to, I want to peel that back a little bit with you. How do, starting from scratch, if I'm a person who isn't used to building relationships, what can I do to do that better? So there's a couple of uh, key things. So first, you need to be deliberate and intentional about who you're trying to build relationships with. Okay. So I would even recommend writing it down, writing a list down of the institutions, the organizations, the companies, the associations, the conferences, past clients, champions, people who already know, like, and love the work that you do, who've mm. been your champions out there, write a list of 50 or 100 of these people who you want to build relationships with. So be deliberate about that and say, like, what are the tools of my tool chest in order to build those relationships, which leads to the next piece. How am I going to deliver value to these people and, and connect and deepen relationships? Mm. So I'm not a believer of you know, just going out there and, um, you know, asking for something that takes something from them, which is what an informational interview is. You're inconveniencing someone or even frankly, going to coffee or lunch. That's okay. It's not great. When I was practicing law for a bunch of years, that's what everyone did. You know, lawyers would meet for lunch or coffee with other lawyers. And at the end they would say like, great, okay, I'm going to refer you. You're going to refer me and great, you know, and nothing would happen. And it just didn't turn into much. So, so think in terms of how can I deliver value to this person? And there's a lot of different ways it could be. It could be that you are a member of a group of Mm. some sort and you could invite someone who you respect and admire to come in and speak to that group and give them an introduction to that group. That could be of tremendous value. So just like something like that could be great, but think in terms of like, what assets do I have? What resources do I have? Or it could be recording a video interview or something along those lines as well. Yeah. It's, you know, one of the things that I learned and relearned from you is you and I are very similar. And so ending our last call took forever. (laughs) Because you and I were like, hey, well, who can I introduce you to? And who can I, what about this guy? Hey, have you ever talked to this guy? And he's got a really cool story and that's a neat story. And you and I just spent some time talking to each other about who else we could introduce, knowing that there's value for for that kind of conversation. And I suppose if you're kind of the person, if you're the kind of person who gives out referrals and networks and makes recommendations, you're also the kind of person who's going to receive those recommendations, who's going to you know, if, yeah. you, if you reach out to the HOA president, the Homeowners Association, or in some countries, it's called the Strata Council president, and you develop a relationship with them and try to help them, they're going to say, you know, who you should talk to uh, the, exactly. our head of maintenance. His name is Jeremy. Great guy. He's having a little trouble right now with the so-and-so contractor. Maybe I should introduce you. Well, yeah. that would be great. Yeah. And, you know, just being aware of what someone needs. So let's say you do know a homeowners or homeowners associate head of a homeowners association. They have 600 units. They have lots of construction issues that you could help with. Yeah. You know, like just listening, what do they need? Because it might not be related to your vocation. So a lot of times we immediately jump to, Oh, how can I help? You know, how can I come in and I can, you know, repair this unit, this kitchen that got burned out. Right. But instead it might be something like, well, the HOA person has a a daughter who's applying to college next year, and you could help in some way. You can introduce them to your sister-in-law who is a college counselor who can give them some advice. Or it could be something like this HOA president mentions casually to you or you overhear it somehow or you view it on on social media that they are going on vacation to Florida next month. And oh, guess what? Your friend lives in Florida and you could get some recommendations and you can give those recommendations to that HOA president. It's yeah. not related to your vocation, but it's still a way of delivering value to someone where then that person going to be immediately turning around and thinking, wow, that's so great that this person helped me. How can I help them back? Right. You know, so it's it's leading by giving value, not in a manipulative way, but just in a way of putting good value out into the universe 
and you're more likely to get things in return when you do that. Yeah. It's looking beyond whatever trade you're doing and trying to really develop those relationships with people. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And deepen in that, you know, how you can take them further. Yeah. So the two things I picked up from you. So, I mean, there's been a lot, John, don't get me wrong, but the two things I wrote down, who do I want to build a relationship with and how will I give them value? Those two right. things. Those are right? two, but there's more. Mm-hmm. So how do I deliver value to them? And then also how am I going to take it further on into the future too? Because you don't want to just drop the ball there. Right. You know, a lot of times you talk to people and they're intimidated by the extroverts of the world. You know, we've probably all been in a social situation where there's some bigger than life personality there. And we think like, that's the great networker. That's the person who is just great at relationships. But the truth is a lot of times those people are not good at following up. And some of the people who are best at relationships, best at networking are the ones who maybe they're even shy or introverted in a public situation like that, but they're really good at following up. They're good at following through, connecting with that person down the line. And so that's going to be a lot more powerful in the long run. So I I tell people to think about that. How can you take this relationship further, continue to deepen that relationship and and, um, have it be something that lasts for years and years to come? Yeah. It's, you know, talking about that makes sense because I'm used to doing that. And I think you're used to doing that. Although I'm I could certainly do a much better job. But, you know, one of the things I think about, which is a really good marketing strategy, and and anybody listening can use this. It's an old fashioned strategy. It works very well, but it's very slow. And it works so well, you'll want more of it, but it still works slow is think about your your ideal neighborhood, wherever you work. And I'm going to assume residential contractors here for a second, but go and find the golf courses, the religious uh, facilities and the private schools in that neighborhood. And they have these things called charity social events where they auction off things. And if you go and find the, the, the president of the, uh, you know, the parent teacher association, whatever it's called, et cetera, and you, you make a relationship with him or her, you say, well, I'd like to donate something and you don't have to donate cash. You can donate something in kind, but it has to be something of value that relates to your business. Well, now, every time you reach out to that PTA member, they're going to remember, oh, you're the person who's supporting our school. And, oh, we should, we should call him for this. And we should ask for that. You just get to know the right people. And it's the same with whatever the religious institutions are in your city. And it's the same with the golf courses. You're just going to get tied in to that market that thinks about things that way. So you could be creative here. You can still build business, but you're doing it by adding value and asking for nothing in return. Just go and help people. And guess what? It just comes back to you. Oh, absolutely. And that is such a great strategy. I know a lot of businesses that have built their business employing a strategy like that, just, you know, finding these institutions and, and, um, you know, delivering something of value. And the thing is, is like, you'll get exposure, whether people take you up on it as, as well, you know, what actually happens in some of these auctions is people will buy bid on them, they'll buy them, and then they never materialize. Yeah. So you didn't actually have to expend any resources on it, but yeah. you got free marketing. That's right. Yeah. Hey, thinking about that, I noticed when I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, you were on the planning commission. I was for how 11 many, how years. How old are you? Are you 972 years old? <laughs> 40, <Gandalf>? 46 <laughs> right now. Um, no, I started during law school. I was my third year of law school. You know, in law school, they say, uh, scare you to death, uh, work you to death, bore you to death. That's the third year of law school is bore oh, you gosh. to death. Yeah. So you get bored by your third year. And I was just looking for something. So I joined my town's design review board, which had an opening. And then after that, I went up to the planning commission and it's a small town. So we didn't have massive projects come through, but I definitely had some interesting, scary situations where I'm presiding over a room full of uh, 150 angry neighbors who all wanted me to do one thing. And I had to, um, you know, decide that I uh, did disagreed with them for, for, you know, different reasons and and had to persuade them that this is why I was deciding this way. Yeah. I think of the episode in Modern Family where Claire wanted to put the speed bump in. Was it that kind of, I don't know if you remember that. I think I saw that one. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But the, the, the reason that popped out in your background in your LinkedIn profile for me is I thought, well, how many of us as builders, general contractors, sub trades are not going to our local planning commission meeting, which I'm going to say at first, you don't have to say it. You don't have to agree or disagree. Those are boring. Oh, they can be. For However, sure. there's some really interesting stuff that that you find out there. Things about how new services are going to be uh, deployed in a new part of the neighborhood. You know where the excavation is going to be going. What's where is going to get wired? All of those things. Yeah. 
Tell me why a contractor should or shouldn't go to a planning commission meeting. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a great way to get to know or even volunteer if you want to. You can volunteer depending on your city or town for these different boards and commissions. Usually they're at a voluntary capacity. I didn't get paid to do it. Um, it. Honestly, it was an amazing way to get to know my community by being on just a design review board. That's and right. There's, there's lots of architects and engineers and art and contractors that join these things. Isn't um, that funny? So there's architects and engineers and people you now are, you're a peer, you're e on equal business stature oh, with them. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, and yeah, it's, I mean, it's a great way to just have your ear to the ground and to see what's going on, to hear about these different projects. I mean, I, I worked on our town's zoning code. I worked on our town's general plan. I, you know, I got to know these things really well. I got to know the town staff really well. Uh, which can be advantageous. So yeah, for sure. And then, yeah, just the, you know, attending those different meetings, you kind of get to know a flavor for, for the community and what's, what's going to fly and what isn't um, that's helpful as well. Yeah. It's, it's just being part of the community, being in there, being seen as a leader, connecting people. And it just becomes a lot easier for people to find you. And then when the, when the time comes, they're like, you're the only renovation contractor for us. You're the best tiling contractor we could get. If we're getting a pool done, we're getting it done by John. Right. Yeah. Um, I got, I have to change subjects here though, because there's something people don't know about you. John, I get a feeling there's stuff that I still don't know about you, but I'll string together this sentence and you maybe help us. How did you get to the white house as a speech writer? How did Rob Lowe play you in what was it? The West wing? The West wing. Yeah. Yeah. How the, Partial. How, how, I, yeah. yeah, sure. Partially more than me. <laughs> hey, more than me. I don't know. How, I heard you were the, the other how how partial inspiration for Rob Lowe's <laughs> character. Uh, yeah. I mean, some people have said it's kind of a partial inspiration for Rob Lowe's character. Um, well, there's a couple of different stories there. Let's let's tackle first the how I got there. So uh, in college, I applied for an internship program um, in Washington, D.C. Mm. And, um, you know, part of that is you get an internship at different uh you know, institutions. And I applied to the white house and I, I got the gig, um, ask for what you want. Yeah. Ask for what you want. Um, so that was the opening that I got, but here's the story is like, I ended up going back to college and I ended up, um, the keeping in touch with the speech writers. Cause I, I was thinking, well, it'd be wonderful to get a job back there after I graduate from mm. college. And um, so I kept in touch. I would send in resources. And, and this gets back to the idea of giving without expectation of anything in return. So I would, you know, the speechwriters, they, they can use different resources like poems or other speeches or quotes mm. or articles, interesting things like that. And so I would just send them in from time to time. And then eventually I heard about an opportunity when the speechwriter said, hey, there's an opening, there's a job, I think it'd be good for you. Let me know about it. Sure. And so the, inter the funny thing was then, I end up getting a call from who ended up hiring me, the woman who ended up hiring me a couple of days later. She tells me of the job, all this kind of stuff, says, please send in some writing samples. And I said, great, I will. But actually, if you open up today's New York Times and you open up to the opinion page, I have a letter to the editor, oh, which my goodness. happened to hit on that day. Now, the thing is, I knew that I would be getting this call. And so I sent in that letter a couple of days beforehand, and it just happened to hit on that day. And so what I say to people is like, you know, take advantage of whatever you can, whatever skill you can be creative because you want to position yourself for that success. So that ended up making a big impression, no yeah. doubt, because that hit on that particular day. And then um, so I ended up working there and um, I, I had worked in Hollywood before. So I'd worked at DreamWorks and I knew people in Hollywood and I knew someone, uh, a friend of mine who was, she was actually she was coming through Washington, D.C. We ended up doing a tour of the White House. And she tells me she has a friend who's starting this new show that's about politics in Washington, D.C. And I'm like, that sounds amazing. And she says, can you give them some advice on what it's like working at the White House? I said, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Now, I could have gotten in trouble for that because everything likes to go through the press office. They like that's to true, kind of control yeah. that stuff. But, you know, I wasn't sharing state, state secrets. I didn't have a, like a high security clearance or anything like that. I was just kind of sharing like what my life was like. Well, yeah. it ended up being Aaron Sorkin, who's the creator of the, the West <laughs> Wing. He had done the he done the American president, which I, yeah. I knew of at the time. You know, it was amazing, present, amazing uh, movie. And I just told him what my life was like. You know, just told him what I experienced, you know, that kind of thing. It wasn't that sexy or exciting. 
But in the fall of 1999, I wrote the presidential proclamation for Thanksgiving, U.S. Thanksgiving. Cool. Um, and I wrote this. And I was pretty proud of it. And they printed on this like large parchment paper. It looks really old fashioned. Yeah. And um, and I sent a copy to him. Now, now to a little Aaron bit of Sorkin. Back to, to Aaron Sorkin. Sorkin. I mailed so again, it developing those relationships. Hey, you just exactly. might be interested in seeing this. Right. This is a piece of my work. Take a look at it here. Just want want to show it to you. You know, didn't hear anything back. Um, and and by the way, the the presidential proclamation, no one pays attention to them now. But but, you know, Washington wrote it himself like Quill Penn in the White House, wrote it out himself. You know, Lincoln, same thing. Right. And actually, Lincoln's was credited with unifying the nation during the, the depths of the Civil War. Oh. So there's some amazing stories about these mm. these you know proclamations that have been done before. I was really proud of the job that I did. So I sent it to him. Flash forward one year later to the next year, I turn on the Thanksgiving episode of The West Wing. The entire story is about the speechwriters that are writing. They're in the process of writing the oh. Thanksgiving rec- proclamation. And, you know, you remember that show. They were running around the White House, yeah. you know, like talking about it. Yeah, yeah, it's just constant drama, not really like everything. Yeah. My life is much more like this, right? You know, like behind a keyboard. But anyways, you know, so they, they do this whole thing. And the very end of the episode, you know, the president, Jed, Jed Bartlett uh, character is about to walk out into the Rose Garden to read the Thanksgiving proclamation. He looks down, he's holding it. You know, it's like climactic, all that kind of stuff. And he's about to read it and he goes down and he says and he looks at it and he and he reads the first line of it. And the first line was the exact same first line of that Thanksgiving proclamation. Fantastic. That I that I'd sent to, the exact same to a T. I love it. And the reason why I say that uh, the reason that the partial inspiration for Rob Lowe's character is because the character that was writing that Thanksgiving proclamation was Rob Lowe. Was Rob Lowe. Yeah. Go home and tell your wife. Hey, honey, guess what? <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Pretty cool. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, yeah. with so, so many interesting lessons along the way at doing what you talked about, building relationships, being open to helping people, asking for nothing in return, taking your friend's friend on a tour, I'm- happened to be Aaron Sorkin. Okay, then you send him something. He doesn't respond, and then you watch the show and go, "Huh." Some pretty cool um, artistic work created there, and I'm glad that you picked out those lessons because I didn't tell that lesson. I didn't tell that story for a lot of years because I felt like it was bragging. Now I tell the story more because I want those lessons to come out of it because I yeah. want people to realize I kind of put my neck on the line a little bit. I I did some things. I helped out without any expectation of return right. and something really magical came from it. And so I tell people that all the time, do things without any expectation of return, help others. You yeah. know, if someone's trying to put something together, whether it's a new business or a new TV show or a, a new project, help them out with any ex- expectation of return and maybe something magical will come from it. Yeah. Hey, I, I learned something from the Australians. I've worked a lot with people in Australia and, they, and this might help you in, you know, in the, in the area of bragging. It ain't bragging. Tall poppy syndrome. It ain't bragging if you done it. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. right. The tall yeah. poppy syndrome is another one, right? Where yeah, the tall poppy is the first one to get cut down. But yeah. it ain't bragging if you done it. And they had said that to me because I was trying to, you know, just trying to be humble. But at, at a certain point, there's a lesson that can be pulled out of those things that you've done. And for everybody listening to this, I want you to pull lessons out of what John's saying here. You may not go and do any work at the White House. You might not do any work at your state legislature or your provincial parliament buildings, but that's not what we're talking about here. What we're talking about is thinking about the world in a way that's held together by relationships. In your town, the relationships might be the city's baseball team. Where I live, it's the city's lacrosse team. In another town, it might be the city's choir or band, church. doesn't matter, but those relationships can give you real value. That's what I'm pulling from you, John. Yeah. And I love that you pulled that out. Um, and, and that's why I tell these stories is to give examples and illustrations for inspiring people to take that kind of action in their local community, to think on their level, mm. um, who are the influencers in my community, who are the institutions, who are the, the sports teams, what are the companies, what are the associations that I can involve myself with, that I can create or establish or deepen a relationship with that's going to be helpful for me going forward. Fantastic. Uh, John, this has been great. If somebody wants to find you in this big wide world, how do we find you? 
Um, you go check me out, rise25.com. The podcast is Smart Business Revolution. I interview successful founders and entrepreneurs like yourself. Um, and I asked them about what relationships got them here today. I've had founders at Netflix and, and Kinko's and EO, YPO, all kinds of different activation blizzards, all kinds of interesting founders. Um, so go check it out. And uh, if anyone has any questions about um, relationship building with content marketing, that's my jam. So send me an email or send me a message on LinkedIn. Happy to talk about it. Fantastic. Well, John, thanks for being here. I appreciate it. And you've already added value to me. I mean, you walk the talk. You introduced me to a couple of great guests. Wink, wink, everybody listening. There are some great guests coming that mm -hmm. came straight from John. And uh, I hope I gave you some good suggestions there as well. You know, one of my good friends who just sold his company is one of your guests. Yeah, I can't wait to interview him. Calvin yeah. Johnson. Yeah, it'd be That's great. Right. It'd be a yeah. lot of fun. Cool. All right, thanks John. So much, Dominic. Yeah, have a great day. We'll talk to you again. You too.